think of a live turkey walking around, gobble, gobble, you know, it's like, you're, you're like, I don't get what he's saying by that, but that's what would conjure up in your mind. But if I say that in about a month, you will not think of a live turkey. What will you think of? You'll think of a turkey on a table. And the reason why you think of a turkey on a table is because of the context. For Americans, it's Thanksgiving. You celebrate by eating turkey, which makes you even more sleepy. <laughs> and that's just what you do. That's what uh, we do in, a, in about a month. That's what we'll do. And the context would dictate what is conjured up in your mind. Or, or if I say, I sat under a tree. If I said that in the summer, I sat under a tree. I sat under the tree or something, something like that. In the summer or the fall, you would, you'd pick, maybe picture me at a park, sitting under a tree, thinking, you know, looking out into the distance, whatever. But if I said that in late December, what would you think? You would not think I was sitting outside, freezing cold, shivering under a tree. You would picture me inside my house with a tree, with lights. And it's because the context would dictate what is conjured up in your mind. You know, what is on your mind if you sat under the tree during Christmas is the Christmas tree. What is conjured up in your mind when you think of a turkey during Thanksgiving is on the, it's on the plate, not walking around. You know, it's like, that's what is conjured up. And the same thing goes when it comes to what Jesus is teaching right here. He is teaching during the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths is another name for it. And there are three aspects of this celebration in which the Jews would celebrate their 40 years in the wilderness. The three aspects were this. First, they would gather in Jerusalem and they'd build these little huts or booths. That's why another name for it was the Feast of Booths. And that was to showcase how when they were in 40 years in the wilderness, they were nomadic. You know, they didn't have stable homes. They were constantly in the move. So they'd build these little huts that wouldn't last very long to symbolize how they used to be a nomadic people. The second thing they would do is they would bring water from the pool of Solomon all the way up to the temple and they would pour it out before the altar right before the morning sacrifice was made. And they did this to show that God provided for them in the 40 years by splitting the rock from Moses, provided water for the people of God. And the third thing they would do, the third part of the, the, the festivities, which was really the culmination of everything, the most exciting part about the Feast of Tabernacles was what's pictured behind me. And they would light these huge candles. They were 75 feet tall. And they would light them up and it would illuminate the entirety of the temple and it would illuminate the entirety of Jerusalem, they said. And they would basically just have this huge party for nights on end where they would light up the temple. There would be an orchestra playing. I don't know what a, you know, first century Jewish orchestra is like, but it, you know, it seemed everybody would dance and, and celebrate and they would celebrate because when they were in the wilderness, God would lead them by night by a pillar of fire. So this is the context. This is the context, the booths, the water, and now the fire. Well, earlier in John 7, Jesus said, I would make streams of living water come from you. And during the Feast of Tabernacles, they're thinking, oh, like that water? And now he says this, I am the light of the world. Now, because of the context, everyone, absolutely everyone who's listening to him, they're thinking about these fires says, I am the light of the world. I am like the pillar of flames that led the Jewish people for 40 years. Now, what a claim that would be to say something like that. I am the reason for this holiday, <laughs> you know? You know, anyone sitting around during Christmas, it doesn't even matter if, if uh, you know, it's a secular Christmas or a Christian Christmas. If anyone around the tree was like, you know what, I'm just so glad that I provided this holiday, <laughs> you know, it's like, isn't it great to celebrate me? You know, that, it, we'd all kind of look over and be like, what are you talking about? But that's really what he's, he's putting himself at the focal point of the, entire, of the entirety of the festivities. I am the light of the world. I illuminate 
everything. I am like the pillar of fire. And then he says this by application. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. And this is taking that imagery of walking throughout the wilderness for 40 years. And it's walking and following the pillar that brings light. Have you ever been on a trail and you're walking with someone as the light is going down, but you're not the one with the flashlight or the camera? Has ever, anyone ever been in a situation like this? What you'll learn very quickly is it doesn't take very long for you to have no light. You know, they get just a few steps ahead of you, and you're like, okay, where am I? You know, it's like, because you're completely dependent on their light, and it doesn't take very long if you're not fastidiously following them to lose all light whatsoever. And he says, those who follow me will have light in the darkness. Follow me and you'll have light, just like the Israelites had light. And then he says, but will have the light of life. But will have the light of life. Now this is taking the imagery of the lights in the temple even just even further. Because in the Old Testament, the light of life, or it says in the Psalms, the light of salvation, or as it says in Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. That is language of God and his word. So he's not just saying, I'm like the pillar of fire. He's saying, I'm like, I am God. And like the word of God who brings light to all of life. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. I am like that. People, listen, listen to me. I am like that. The philosopher Charles Taylor, he writes about secularism and just our current modern, the way we live. And he says, because uh, we live in a secular state where uh, people, at least there's an option to believe that everything is just nature, everything is just matter. What it does to faith is it thins it out. It, th it thins it out. It dilutes it. And it creates an environment where faith is just one of the many options. Where faith is just one of the many options. So before before this state, people would, would believe in God. Now, they might not all believe in the same God. You know, there might be a pantheon of gods, and they're like, well, I serve this God, or I serve that God. But they lived in a world in which there, it was supernatural, by definition. There's something up there, and it affects all the things down here. But the way people think today is not like that. There, there, there could be something up there, there could be a God, or there could be you know, a variety of different gods that people might believe. But then there's an option of, but there could be nothing. And that's what makes our modern days so different than it was in the past. There's that option of like, well, there could be nothing. And he says that this, this reality, the, the, the air that we breathe, what it does is it thins out faith. And he applies it, you know, we might think of just applying it to people that don't believe. Well, yeah, yeah, people don't believe, they're more likely not to believe. But no, he's talking about it thins out faith of people who actually believe. It thins out the faith of people who actually believe, or at least has the potential to thin out the faith of people who actually believe. Now, how, how does this apply? You know, I want you to think of the top verses that you think about when making decisions. Think of the top verses that you think about. Now, I'm speaking directly to Christians here. So if you're, here's just a guess, just tune out for, for a second. But Christians, what are the top verses that you think about when making big decisions? What are the top verses you think about when going through trials? What are the top verses you think about when parenting? What are the top verses you think about as applied to money or sex or your work? If you're drawing a blank, your faith has been thinned out. And you're treating God as just one of the many options. It's kind of like when you put in the GPS and it gives you the different routes. You're like, okay, well, I get to pick the route. 
Like that's what it's treating God like. That you're, the faith has been thinned out where it's not his light that is lighting the path. His light is just one of the options. One of the light options for you. And it might be a good option, and in fact, it might be the best option, but it's still just an option. And what Jesus is saying here is not that he's an option. <laughs> like, one of the many options. He says, I am the light of the world. I am the light to the path. I am the light of all of life. You know, right, right now, there are people in North Carolina that still don't have power. But you know they can see right now because there's a light source that doesn't turn out, thankfully, the sun. They can see. And it's like when we talk about Jesus, we're talking about that kind of light source. And the only thing bad about the analogy is it's horribly not to scale. The sun is like this. <laughs> it's like we're talking about the light source to everything, the light source to all of life. And if you're here and you say, you know, I follow that. Okay, I, I would be someone that agrees with the statement, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. I would say, that's what I'm trying to do. There should be verses for every single one of those categories. Because that is light to your path. And if there aren't, it's, it's okay to be young and still learning. It's okay to be ignorant. If you're, if you're still going towards knowledge, going, trying to learn. But if it's willful, you're just treating God like an option. A good accessory to your life. And Jesus will not be an accessory. He is the light. He is the light of everything. He is the light of life. But you might be here. And I know we're, you know, we're in downtown Providence. We have a lot of students, a lot of people coming, trying to figure out what they believe. You're like, yeah, I don't, well, I'm still trying to figure it out. I don't even know if I put Jesus in that category yet. Well, hold, hold on just for a second. We'll address that at the end of the, the next point, which is this. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the truth. It says this in verse 13. So the Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. See, in, in Jewish law, in order for a testimony to be true, you had to have multiple witnesses. You know, and there, this is, we have a very similar uh, government system in the sense of you, you have multiple different witnesses, either multiple witnesses that are people or multiple witnesses. Uh, DNA, now in modern times, DNA is also one of the witnesses that is considered. But you have, in order for something to be true, there may, may be multiple witnesses. And they're accusing, you're like, you're just speaking about yourself. How can we trust what you say? How can we trust what you say? And this is the thing about when people are putting, putting in their heels when it comes to the evidence, it does, there's a certain type of skepticism that is honest, looking for answers, and there's a certain type of skepti skepticism that it doesn't matter how much evidence is put in front of them, they're just, it'll just be on to the next question. And we see here with the Pharisees, as you read from John 1 all the way up until John 8, they're in the second category. He has done miracles in front of them. He has had people witness about who he is. He's given plenty, but they're like, where's your witness? Now, as we looked at last week in the early verses of John, the early verses of John has the story of the adulterous woman. And we talked about how it probably wasn't in the early manuscripts. It was probably put in there later because it's not in some of the early manuscripts. But people ask, why? You know, why was it put in where it is? And I think this is the reason why. Because as we saw last week, they brought the adulterous woman and nobody was willing to be a witness because to be a witness means if it, if it turned out she was innocent, you'd receive the same punishment, which would be death. And... They were, uh, even if they were willing to be witnesses, they did in a poor way, meaning the man should have been there too. They weren't following the law at all. I think, and this is just the hypothesis, that when it was put there, it was to show that they didn't actually care about a witness. 
Does that make sense? It's like, where's your witness? I think as you're reading through John, they put it there to be like, wait a second, these people don't care about witnesses. It's kind of like when politicians talk about character. What, what they mean when they say character is the character of their opponents. That's what they mean. <laughs> no, nobody, nobody cares about the character of the people on their side. It's just when it's politically advantageous. That's what they mean. And it's like the Pharisees, you don't care about witnesses. You don't care. But Jesus, in his patience, answers their questions. And this is what he says. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. And what he means by this is you judge according to the flesh means you judge like humans. And when he says, I judge no one, it doesn't mean that he doesn't judge. In fact, throughout John, there are several places where it says that Jesus does judge and judges rightly. What he means is, he is I don't judge like you. Humans, we are very poor judges. We're very poor judges. And he's like, Jesus is saying, I'm not like that kind of judge. Humans, we judge based off of appearance. You know, that we have the saying for a reason, don't judge a book by its cover. And as much as we say that, we still do it. We still do it. We just look at someone, we size them up, and we make a judgment in our minds about them. And, and But God, and Jesus continually sh showed this, he did not do that. He judged for what he what was true. You know, there are so many people that people just ro wrote off within the Gospels, and Jesus didn't write them off. He brought them in. Or we judge based with partiality. Do you know your favorite thing about people? Let me tell you a little bit of a secret about yourself and about me too. Your favorite thing about people is how much they like you. It's very hard to like someone who doesn't like you. And they could be the most spectacular person in the world. They could have all the skill sets and all the talents, and they could be so funny and fun to be around, but if they're indifferent towards you, they're horrible. <laughs> and it's, you know why that, that is? You're, impartial, you're a partial judge. Jesus is not like that. He's very used to people not liking him. And he's an impartial judge. He judges straight down the line. Or humans, we judge with selfish motives. Yeah, you know, it's very hard to be an impartial judge when your job is on the line, when it could affect the bottom line. Jesus, <laughs> he was not like that. Just straight down the line. This is what is true. He's like, I don't judge like you guys judge. And then in verse 16, he says, yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. Meaning, okay, you want a witness? I don't need a witness. That's what he's saying first. If I judged, it would be true. I don't need a witness. In the same way, the sun doesn't need a witness for light. It just is. Light doesn't need a witness. It just shines. You know, it's, it'd be like catching someone in the act in some devious, devious act with a flashlight, and you're like, it doesn't count. You don't have two flashlights. You know, it's like, that doesn't make sense. Light just reveals. And he says, I don't, need, I don't need a witness, but if you want one, how about my Father in heaven? He witnesses. He sees. He is an impartial judge. It's election season. And there's a possibility, my wife just, uh, did you just go, ooh. <laughs> oh, that wasn't me, that was somebody, oh, it was, it was my daughter. <laughs> like, oh no. <laughs> don't worry, don't, don't get too nervous. And it's a time where people will talk about politics. If they will, this is, this is the seat. Most people still avoid it, which is often wise. But it is the season in which people say, what do you believe? What do you think about, what do you think about this? And this is my advice to you. Okay, this is my advice. Uh, if you feel equipped, you feel like the timing is good, if you, I, I would certainly have those conversations, but have this conversation first. Say something like this. I would love to talk about blank with you. But could we first talk about how 
you determine what is right or what is wrong for everything. And then we can talk about this issue. So what that does, what that does is it puts it back, it takes it just one step back and says, okay, before we talk about what standards we should have in our country, let's talk about where we get our standards from. That's what it's doing. Because that's what it, all, all the friction over politics, that's what it's over, what's right, what's wrong. And it's kind of silly to argue back and forth about what's right and what's wrong if you don't have a standard of what's right and what's wrong. So, for, for example, immigration. Some people say we should secure the border. Others say you need to have an open border. You know what you should say first? Who says? Why? Let's get back to the, like, by what standard for both questions, both points, by what standard? Or um, people talking about Ukraine. We should help Ukraine. We should stop helping Ukraine, okay? Okay, why? By what standard? Who says? Or uh, yesterday, there was a pro-Palestinian march, downtown Providence. Hundreds of people, it looked like. And uh, uh, a part of me... Now, now, to be honest, this is not to belittle uh, an important topic, but when I first saw it, this is, this is uh, really what, the first thing that came to my mind. Uh, yesterday was, was my, my birthday, and, and I did not say that for that purpose. Um, <laughs> um, but I was at a baseball game with my kids, and after the baseball game, they had Oktoberfest, so like bouncy houses and all this, and I was trying to convince them the whole time that it was for my birthday. Like, come, shut up, Dad. No, there's no way. You know, it's like that's not true. But so when I got I got online, and I saw there's this huge march. I'm like, oh, a part of me wants to just throw throw them in the car, and drive downtown, and try to convince them it was for my birthday. You know, <laughs> but I'm like, that'd take too much time for just a joke, and I don't think I should. That was my first impulse. Second impulse is this: is, is I wonder if you went down and everyone marching. You just ask them, do you think there's objective truth? Do you think there's objective morality? And where do we get it from? Do you think there's objective truth? Do you think there's objective morality? And where do you get it from? And I wonder how many people would say, yes, and this is where we get it from. Now, I'm not saying anything about Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I'm not saying anything about whether or not we should support Ukraine. I'm not saying anything about immigration. They're all serious issues. What I'm saying is if you don't talk about the first question, you have nothing to say in the second question. Who says? Why? Now back to the people that's like, well, I'm just trying to figure things out. I don't know what I, what I believe. In order to make judgments, you first have to believe there's a judge. In order to make judgments, you first have to believe there is a judge. C.S. Lewis said, I believe in God the way I believe in the sun, not because I can look up in the sky and see it, but because by it I see everything else. Don't believe in something that turns out all of the lights on your morality. Don't believe in something that turns out all the lights on your morality. So don't swallow a worldview where you're just developed animals highly developed animals, and there's no objective truth outside of nature because that has implications. You know, we, in all these issues that I just mentioned, virtually everyone would say we shouldn't kill the innocent. And we're trying to find ways, the best way of applying that principle, but high majority of the, pers of the people you talk to on the streets would say that point. Do you think we should kill the innocent? And all of these, high majority of people would say, yeah, I think that's wrong. But why? You know lions, a male lion will come in, kill the alpha of, of the, the tribe or his little harem, kill all the younglings of that alpha, and then restart with the female lions. You know, you know um, I believe it's, oh, what is it? It's otters. I think it's otters. Don't quote me if, if, I'm, 
if I'm misremembering, if you're like, no, it's ferrets, and I'm, you're slandering otters, <laughs> you know, it's like, but I believe it's otters that they will literally force themselves upon female otters, trying to impregnate as many as possible. If we're just highly developed animals, who's to say the otters aren't right? Who's to say the lions aren't right? Don't swallow a worldview that turns off all the moral lights. Choose a worldview that turns the lights on. And then with the lights on, you can have uh, cognitive, honest, thorough conversations about immigration, Ukraine, and the war in Israel. Because God is the one who judges. He is the light. He is the light of truth, objective truth. Let's go on to the last one. Jesus is the light of God. The light of God. Verse 17, it says, In your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. He's re-quoting the, quote that, uh, the verse that they're quoting at him. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. Same thing we've talked about. I'm bearing witness about myself, but if you need a second witness, my Father is also a witness. Verse 19, They said to him, therefore, where is your father? Now, this question could be a legitimate question. Okay, who is your father? But it's more than likely not because they slander him later with this fact. They say later of like, we weren't born by sexual immorality. Meaning, what was the rumors about Mary is, you know, she claimed to be born of a virgin miraculously by God. We all know the truth. So this is probably, we don't know for sure, we can't go back and read what was in their heads, probably a slanderous question. Where is your father? <laughs> That's probably what they were saying. And again, patience, it's just, just think of Jesus being God, just everyone's dead, you know, it's like just no one can talk anymore. Like that's the power he has, but he lovingly, patiently gives them an answer. You know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. He gets to the heart of the matter. The reason why you do not understand me is not because you actually care about my lineage. It's not because you actually care about me having a witness. It is because you do not know God. It is because you do not know my father. There are seven I am statements in John. This is the second one in John 8. Uh, a little bit later in John 14, we'll read another I am statement where Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. He's saying there's no way, no way to the Father except through me. If you knew me, you would know the Father, and if you knew the Father, you would know me. They go together. There's no knowing of God except through Jesus. Now, how, how is this the case? There are many ways that we could answer that, but I want you to think for a second of heaven. What is, what is heaven like? If you picture heaven, what is heaven like? What, what, give out a few answers. We are a small enough group. We can shout out a few answers. What is heaven? Pure? Yes. Peace. Perfect. Beautiful. Floating on clouds. Okay, so let's imagine for a second. Okay, heaven is like that, and then you walk into heaven. Is it still pure? Is it still perfect? Is it still beautiful? I mean, perfectly beautiful. You're all beautiful, but perfectly beautiful? The answer is what? No, it's not. It's not. It's no longer perfect. It is no longer pure. It is no longer perfectly beautiful. Because we're there. So when, when Jesus offers up life, and not just life here and now, but eternal life, eternal life in heaven, eternal life, when God restores heaven and earth, the new heavens and the new earth, how could we possibly be there? How could it... 
Jesus possibly be, be the bridge to the Father? There's another way of saying that. Well, if you continue to read in John, it says that someday that he would die for their sins. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That Jesus on the cross took all of their sin, all the times they bore false witness, like these Pharisees, all the times that they knew where the light, light shone and they decided to go the other way, all the times they did not listen to his word as, and just created him like one of the options. He takes on that judgment. The judge takes on the judgment and receives the punishment for our sins. He says, so those who believe shall not perish. Those who trust in that can know the Father. And as Paul writes later, they receive the righteousness of God. When in, in belief, we receive the righteousness of God. So although you and yourself, you're not pure, you're not perfect, you're not perfectly beautiful, because of what Jesus has done, you receive his righteousness. So as you step into heaven, either the spiritual heaven that exists right now or the new heavens and the new earth, when this earth is now is in the future restored to perfection, you can be there. Not because of what you have done, but because of what Jesus has done for you with his righteousness, his perfection, his purity, his beauty. That's how you know the Father. That's, that, he is the bridge. He is the bridge to knowing the Father. And he, what he says to the Pharisees, he can also say to us. If you do not know Jesus, you do not know God. And if you do not know God, you do not know Jesus. He is the bridge to knowing God. Now, what's their reaction? Their reaction is very similar to the reaction that we receive today in our day and age. Verse 20, it says, These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. Now, John says this. No one arrested him. In other translations, it says nobody laid hands on him or no one seized him. It's more, it's less as in breaking the law or arrest and more of like doing harm, seizing him. And John puts that as an aside because a lot of the original readers, remember the original audience is not just those who are hearing Jesus' teaching, but those who are reading John's account of Jesus for the first time too. And they'd be thinking, certainly they're going to hurt him now. <laughs> it's like, certainly they're going to do something. And he says, no, 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 not yet. They're not going to do something yet. But those same readers who, re who were reading John for the first time through, they had seen this imagery before, that of the light, Jesus being the light of the world. They had seen this type of rejection before. And like anyone who you're just reading a novel for the first time, you're starting to put the pieces together. You're not sure how it's going to end, but you're putting all the pieces together. And this is one of the pieces that would probably lock in. Is as they were reading, they would read John 3, obviously, before John 8. And this is what it says. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. So, you, you know, someone reading John for the first time, you, as a disciple, he writes it down. People would read John 3, then they get to John 8. What they would know about humanity, and if they were self-aware about their own soul, is we have a disposition to avoid light. Because light exposes. There, there's something that I've always wanted to do, and if you see it, if you read the Providence Journal and you see that this occurred, you know, you'll know it's me. I've always wanted to sneak into a, a club some Saturday night, Friday night, and find where the, the breakers are and do a social experiment, okay? And just turn on all the lights, okay? And this is my hypothesis. This is my hypothesis. That the environment of the club before the lights turn on and after the lights turn on will be very different. Do you think I'm right? <laughs> I think so too. I just think it'd just be hilarious. You know, it'd just be, it could go on TikTok. It'd be, go viral on TikTok if you put that there. Okay, but the, th the principle is, 
when the lights turn on, people act different. And this is not just physically, with physical light. This is spiritually as well. It shines. And this is why we hate things that expose. This is why if you show up to a work, uh, to a job and you work your tail off and everyone else is you know, just kind of working when the boss is around, they'll start to hate you because light exposes. Not just physical light, but spiritual light. That, that's just the nature of things. And when it comes to light, there are two options. And these are the two options you see in John 3 and the two options you see in John 8. Either you can hate it or you can step into it. Either you can hate it, or as it says in John 3.21, but whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Now think of that phrase, clearly seen. If you step into the light, Jesus is the light of the world. You step into the light. What is clearly seen? All the things you didn't want exposed to begin with. That is what is clearly seen. And that is a beautiful picture of what it means to become a Christian. Is when you see what Jesus has done for you, you see his death on the cross, you see that he loves you and he cares for you and he does not want you to perish, and he created you for a purpose, and you see that he will take care of my sin, and you step into the light. It means all the things that you're previously trying to hide are now exposed but you're okay with it because you know those sins have been taken care of, that they no longer identify you, they no longer enslave you, they no longer dictate your future, both in this life and the next, that you can say, you know what, here it is, and it's taken care of. And the only witness I care about and the only judge I care about and the only light I care about is Jesus. And he says that I am loved, I am accepted, I am wanted and I am pure and righteous and perfect and beautiful. That's what it means to come into the light. And that's what he's offering to the world. And over the next four weeks, we're just going to look more into like this Jesus. Who is he and what has he done for each one of us? Let's pray.